Welcome to another episode of the Loadout Music Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with a wide range of music personalities, from Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, to Grammy winners, and today's rising stars. Recorded in St. Louis, Missouri, now here's your host, Aaron Perlett of Atomic Junk Shop. Welcome back to the Loadout Music Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Perlett. Today, we welcome in singer-songwriter Andrew Browning of Andrew Browning and the Nine Pound Hammers, who has a new album out called Love is a Beautiful Thing. Andrew, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for uh, being with us. Aaron, thanks for having me. So what the hell is a Nine Pound Hammer? <laughs> you know, that comes from an old uh, Merle Travis song that you may or may not be aware of. Um which is uh, really a reference to uh, digging coal, but, um, you know, also to, you know, these um, sort of uh, songs of that time, there were songs called hammer songs, right? That were, uh, you know, mostly bluegrass and old country songs that uh, sort of relayed um, uh, the struggles of people in manual labor and uh, probably also some reference to, uh, the uh, uh, sort of folk hero, John Henry, right, who you may recall tried yeah. to uh, beat the steam hammer uh, using a manual hammer to uh, dig a railroad tunnel, I think, as the story goes. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. Now we've got that cleared up, the big questions. Uh, so you're a California guy, right? I am indeed, yes. Um, what What part of California did you come up in? Well, I originally grew up in New England. Um, okay. I grew up in Connecticut, and uh, but I I moved to uh, Los Angeles when I was eighteen years old, and I've been living there since then. Right on. You know, it's interesting. There is um, so much, such a, a deep history of great Americana music that has come out of uh, you know going back to Merle Haggard and. Um, the birds that have really come out of kind of the Bakersfield area. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just kind of, it, it seems like there's this ongoing legacy, although the music universe is kind of, um, is, is kind of shifting. It seems like almost everything is done in Nashville these days, unless you're like R and B or, or just pure pop. Um, so it, does, does, did that have a, a, a big influence on you? Uh, as you were kind of developing your musical identity or had that already kind of taken hold when you were growing up in New England? Yeah. You know, when I, when I was growing up um, yeah, I, I, I got a lot of that. We had, um, I was in elementary school, we had this sort of music teacher and she was this sort of old hippie, you know, and she had big jumbo guitar. And so in that music class, even in, in elementary school, you know, we were singing, uh, certainly, you know, she'd have us singing all the Bob Dylan songs and, and certainly some, uh, Johnny Cash songs and, and Willie Nelson and all that type of stuff. Um, I don't know if there was any Merle Haggard in there, but, um, that, uh, that sort of style of, of, um, folk and country and singer songwriter stuff. Yeah. was with me as a child. I, I certainly remember the, um, you know, my parents had that first Willie and Whalen eight track tape and and I used to listen to that a lot. And um so yeah, that 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 started pretty early on um uh as a child. That was sort of a a a, a formal part of my music upbringing. What was the point for you where you're like, well, this is kind of a thing that I'm gonna pursue and and make a priority in my life? You know, it was it was really early on. Um, you know, I think I wanted to be, you know, 10 years old, right? I want to be a rock and roll star. And um I played, you know, uh uh throughout high school and then, you know, professionally all the way through my twenties. And then by the time I got to 30, um tired and broke, uh <laughs> um I, I sort of made a pivot and 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 went into technology. I had uh kid on the way and uh you know that that you know that sort of uh uh you know makes you feel like you got to go get a spear and go out and start killing some some food to eat it yeah. and um so i actually got out of the business for uh, about uh, 10 or 12 years and and didn't really think anything of it i wasn't bitter or anything i just you know i decided that it was time to do something else and then i got um 
you know, called out to play with a friend of mine and, and, you know, I pushed him off a bunch of times. I, I, I said, come on, you know, I don't even have any gear left or anything. I just got a flat top guitar. He goes, Oh, you got to come out and play. And somehow he, he suckered me out at that. I think I said, I'd come out and watch him play. If, if he'd buy me a couple of whiskeys and uh, he said, okay, okay. And so I went out and ended up sitting in on a song and it was, uh, you know, what I imagined, you know, a, a relapsing drug addict going through. And so then I just sort of got started back in it slowly from there, you know, mostly just uh, playing with friends and going to jam sessions. And then this led to that. And, you know, now I, here I am three albums deep with this uh, current project. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed. Cause I mean, cause you and the nine pound hammers, I think your first like full length album was in 21 and you've had a, a handful of EPs and singles as well. Um, so it, it's almost like you're having this kind of career renaissance. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm presuming you and I are of a similar age, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, which I can relate to as well, because, um, you know, I, I didn't uh, my band is maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven years old. And I didn't start doing music until uh, or making music uh in and touring until a much later age so i uh, although it wasn't something that i had beyond a passion for it early in life it was something that i actually picked up as more of a vocation much much later in life but you obviously had a real skill set that you were honing you know growing up yeah and 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 um yeah yeah it's interesting you know um and, and i had a really good time with it but but it's interesting um you know, when I got to a point in my life when I decided that I had to just, you know, put it down for a while, um, I didn't really have a problem with that. And and the I think the interesting thing was I kind of got dragged back into it on some level, kicking and screaming. Um, and, uh, and, and it was sort of slow progression, you know, because when I got back into it, I was just hanging out with some friends, you know, and we get out once a month and sort of get on the gas and play some old Merle Haggard covers and things like that. And then, um, then all of a sudden, you know, I started writing songs again and I thought, wow, this is, this is problematic. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> this led to that. And uh, I ran into um, a guy I had played with several, you know, many years earlier, Derek O'Brien, um, who was uh you know, he's he's like a an Orange County punk rock guy. He'd been in uh the Descendants and Agent Orange and uh Social Distortion and um yeah. he, he produced he's he produced your yeah. most recent record. Yeah, he's produced the last three and uh he said, Oh, he goes, I love your stuff. Let's let's make a record. And I said, Oh, come on, man, I don't want to hear nothing about any records. And uh, but you know, and it was sort of one of those deals where he um he sort of gently coaxed me over time and uh, that partnership I think has uh, really paid off and I'm, I'm sort of grateful uh, for it. Um, you know, he's, he's really talented producer and I also like the sort of uh, sparklings of orange County punk that sort of wind up throughout the records. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, as I was kind of, researching you and listening spending some time listening to your music and particularly the new the new record love is a beautiful thing um it has this this really the the dichotomy of sounds is really fascinating to me it's kind of like if you took lou reed and and had supplanted him into the uh you know into the west coast when he was making rock and roll and not simply just trying to alarm people with his behaviors um kind of like some of his later stuff because you have like everything from big horns big backing vocals um like organ at times gives some of the stuff like in rock and roll ca uh, cocaine the organ was almost like playful in it and then you have songs like you know preachers of soul which is really soulful but also has big guitars and then songs like, you know, Rose Avenue and Main Street, that's more like a, a straightforward rock and roll sound. Um, it, it, the the breadth of the sounds, it makes a lot of sense knowing that Derek's background comes from kind of this punk place. You come from some of this, this Americana space that you've got this broad ranging record that you've developed. Yeah, I think what um, what I was trying to do this time around was really 
sort of take a lot of risks, right? And and see see where we could go with the interpretation on some of these things. Um, you know, because oftentimes it just start out with an acoustic guitar. And I think like a, you know, like a lot of artists, I just have my my cell phone and I've got my whatever that that sort of dictation app is you get with an iPhone. And uh when I'm when I'm writing, I just sort of whip that thing out and turn the dictation app on and move through some ideas and, you know, I wind up with the mountain ideas over, you know, months and months. And then I sort of whittle them down and whittle them down. Um, and then, you know, when I, when I end up bringing the stuff to Derek, he's really good at, at saying, Hey, you know, this is really great, but you know, what happens if we turn it into a waltz or, you know, what happens if we go for, you know, sort of a 1960s wall of sound here or something like that. And I think that that's, um, that's really good because he's coming, he's coming from a place and from some ideas that wouldn't naturally occur to me. And um, I think in terms of, you know, we were sort of going for a Stax horn se uh, section sound on rock and roll cocaine, um, you know, and that was that, that was something that wouldn't have initially occurred to me. So um I, but you've yeah. also got in that song, you've also got kind of the big choir feel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You. Whereas, you know, to go back to that 60s reference, um, you know, in Preachers of Soul, it, it does have more of kind of this. Um, it, it's got the 60s, almost like a doo-wop backing. The, 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 it's, a, it's a much different feel on that song, but it's they're both they just fit it's it's fa it's fascinating to go from song to song throughout the record yeah i think we i think we stitched it together pretty well and um i was super happy with it you know and and i think as we were going through it um you know there was a, a you know were points where i was thinking you know are we going too broad you know are we are we taking stylistically you know uh so many risks that we won't be able to connect it all uh, in a thread, uh, you know, sort of narratively through the record. And, and I think we, we managed to, uh, to make that work, uh, and, and to sort of capture everything we wanted to capture. And I think also there, there was a lot of thought and sort of back and forth and revision into the song order once it was mixed, because I think if we'd put them in a different order, we might not have gotten the same continuity through it. Um, and I think I think also we were sort of uh, in the variation of the different uh, sort of uh, uh, arrangements, looking for things that sort of encapsulated sort of all different parts of uh, sounds that we hear in California. You know, certainly San Fernando catches that sort of Mexican American uh, sort of mariachi norteña horn sound that I think is so prevalent um in los angeles and sort of where uh you know every time you're you're sort of out on the streets you can kind of hear it in certain parts of town and um it's fundamentally los angeles so i think what we're really going for is is how do we get all of these sort of fundamentally los angeles sounds over time and california sounds over time and i, I think we we did a pretty good job of it do you feel like the new album is a, a far reaching differentiation from say like uh, the midnight desert talk radio or, or blood on the door, your, your earlier two albums, or do you think they're, they're like a c consistent progression at the very least? I, I, I think, I think there's a progression in going from something that uh, was safe in terms of my idea of the arrangements to something where we were taking sort of more risks and more risks along the way. Um, I think, you know, blood on the door. It's a little more, little more sort of elements, I guess, of sort of punk rock in there and sort of grittiness. I think the midnight desert talk radio sort of steps up. It's a little bit more narrative, um, a little bit cleaner. Um, probably, you know, maybe, maybe stylistically a little bit riskier, but maybe not so much. I think what we're trying to do is sort of refine that sound and saying, oh, well, this is a good record, but let's, let's make something a lot better. And then this one, I think there was a conscious effort to stylistically sort of reach into our bag of tricks and see what we could come up with. Yeah. So um, at, at our collective advanced age, 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about something because I know how I approach this, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Is this now like your primary gig where you're thinking, I want to make this my thing. I am committed to hitting the road touring or, you know, I know in some cases people will, will kind of find that, that halfway point where they'll tour only regionally, maybe every once in a while, a festival here and there, that's a far stretch. How, what is it? How are you approaching this? Um, you know, in that kind of, you know, as you noted before, you, you, you know, you took 10, 12 years off, focus on IT career or technology career, and now really digging into music. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly, certainly regionally. And then, you know, uh, for road stints, it really comes down to making economic sense, right? Yeah. Um, it's not, not something I'm willing to, uh, uh, I, you know, I can't drag a whole group of, you know, six other people off on the road and, and bleed a lot of red ink. Um, it is something where I can, I can certainly afford on some level to break even, meaning if I can get all my people, you know, fed and watered along the way, uh, we're good. But, you know, I think as, as, you know, we see even, even with a lot of, you know, national acts, you know, the, the black keys, right. You know, it turns out to be, you know, they had to shrink that tour down a whole lot because it wasn't, you know, really possible for them to make any money any other way. And I think we've seen that with a lot of artists. So, um, I, I, I treat it as a business and every time I go out, I treat it as a business. So it's not something where I have to think about, you know, am I getting rich or something, but it's definitely something where the, there's gotta be enough compensation for it to make sense. Yeah. I mean, the economics, as we both know, are, are challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And even, uh, you know, booking is, a uh, it's, it's, you know, it's like, uh, stuffing a bottle in your ear it's just booking is the worst thing ever but uh, <laughs> but but in, it, it, the economics are challenging especially you know you're touring with you said a six-person band mm -hmm. um the bigger the band gets you know you mentioned feeding and watering everyone um it becomes more challenging i know that you know we have different versions of the band the core band is four much easier to travel with much easier to make the economics worse or it worked rather but uh you know theoretically we'd love to have keys with us at every stop we'd love to have backing vocals but you've got to i'm sure you have to make some hard choices sometimes that that just make sense for you and that are just more feasible yeah and and i'm a, I, look i'm a little bit of a pain in the ass about it too because i want everything to sound like the record you know yeah and um so many, you know, if, if I go without the oohs and the ahs, you know, that, that, that takes away from, you know, a big part of what we're trying to do, not just on this record, but the other records. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, I mean, in my sort of the perfectionist, I am, I'm not, there, there are definitely, I will say sort of different I, I have a rotating cast of people that I, that I get in and out, you know, cause sometimes people are on the road, sometimes they're unavailable, but yeah, I prefer not to sort of go out with three of six pieces, right. To try to try to do the interpretation, um, uh, you know, just to, just to say, you know, that I, I shipped off to Scranton or something like that and then, and, and come back. And I think, um, I, I, I think I recall, I saw some time ago that you'd uh had ray wiley hubbard on your show and who you know i mean i'm such a huge fan of ray wiley hubbard and i i think he's been mentioned now more songs than t-rex which i think is great um but uh you know if you look at ray wiley's schedule he's pretty much a regional cat you know every once in a while he'll you know you'll see that he's in nashville or you know you might see him in in new york or you know sometimes he's you know rarely shows up in LA, but, you know, he's floating around New Braunfels, Texas and places like that. Um, and I think also, you know, because, because it's, you know, it, it, it's an economics thing. So uh, yeah, first and foremost, look, we love getting out, love playing and, you know, the economics do, do, um, do matter. 
Yeah, no question about it. And, you know, Ray, um, Ray, you're, you're absolutely right. Ray primarily plays between Austin and Dallas. Um, he just bought a place up in New Mexico, so now he's going to probably play there a little more too. But even within that framework, he only tours with his son and a drummer, and the drummer's got a bass pad on the kit so they can replicate having a bass player. So when they want to travel light, they travel really light. Um, and then when they're playing, uh, a, you know, a big venue, like he played in Red Rocks last year with a couple different acts, including Whiskey Myers, they did a full four piece band. So he'll do that, but you're right. It, it's pretty few and far between. So, um, yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. And, and I mean, I think the nice thing is that being based in California, you've got a really good appetite for the sounds you guys are producing within two, three hour drive um, and a lot of different options. It just comes down to, again, the, the cancer that is booking, which is the yeah, worst. No, and, 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 you know, I have, you know, I, I have a uh, management work that works on booking, you know, so okay. I'm not having to pick up the phone all the time, which is really nice um, because yeah, it, it, it's tough. And, and, and even it's tough for the guys who are booking all the time, you know, for, for acts, right. Because, you know, it's tough to get people on the phone. It's tough to guarantee the money. Um, so yeah, it, it is tough, but, but you're right. You know, look, we, we, you know, within, within reasonable distance, I've got Las Vegas, I've got San Diego, I've got San Francisco, um, you know, Portland, Oregon, uh, maybe Seattle, um, you know, we can get out to, uh, Phoenix, Arizona or Flagstaff, something like that. We can get out to Salt Lake city. So there's, 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 within reasonable distance and ability to get out places um regionally that makes sense um you know somebody was talking to me about uh you know daryl's house in new york and i thought wow how great would that be but yeah you know, it's a big lift man that's getting everybody on airplanes you know there's a lot going on so um and and usually when i hear about that i think okay well can we you know throw three or four dates you know in there in that area to uh, get it to make sense. Um, and uh, on that particular one, I haven't heard back yet, but yeah. So, so regionally it's a lot easier. Uh, it's a lot more financially viable. Um, but yeah, yeah. You know, picking up, you know, I have friends who pick up and go off to Europe and then they'll grab a pickup band in, in Europe and just, you know, sort of hit the road with them, uh, you know, night after night, after night, after night. Um, I'm uh, for better or worse, you know, sort of like to have a, my completely rehearsed band with me, you know, wherever we go. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Browning, the album is love is a beautiful thing. Andrew, what's, um, what's, what do, so the album is dropping as of, as of our taping of this right about now. Um, what's the, the next six months hold for, for you and the band as you, you know, promote the record, try to, you know, get visibility, get some traction with it. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's getting out, you know, regionally, uh, and, and, you know, getting in front of the people and, and, and if we're doing our job right, we're, we're taking them away from their, uh, their daily worries three minutes at a time, right? That, that's what we're doing. Making just, like sure porn. People... just like porn. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and really that's it. You know, what can we do to put the smile on people's faces? Uh, so yeah, there'll be an assault of, uh, live dates coming up over the next six months. And, um, there's also, you know, uh, uh, sort of behind the scenes, you know, a lot of efforts to try to get sync and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, advertising campaign going on to, uh, try to grow it. So, you know, the, uh, trying to get some vertical revenue streams, you know, get as many vertical revenue streams as we can with it um, and just have a good time, you know, because that's the thing I, I you know, I never want to lose sight of. Right. I really dig it. I have a good time with it. Um, and even with the, you know, the uh, headaches that come with this type of thing, you know, booking and, you know, uh, you know, getting paid and all this type of stuff, it's there. Those are first world problems. Right. So uh, so I try not to let it get too much into my head. And I, I've sort of got got a pretty good nose for what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and um so we're just sticking with what makes sense yeah you know 
I love it so much. I'd probably play for a mayonnaise sandwich, but that's me, you know, so uh, it's really. Uh, well, I, I think that's most of us to tell you the truth. And, and, and sort of when I said, you know, for me to break even means I don't really need to make any money, but I got to make sure everybody else is making money. I, yeah. I never, I never want to ask any of my people to do anything. Certainly not for free. And I don't ever want them. To, I don't even like to ask them to do it on sale. So basically, uh, you know, I, I generally like, I'm a big fan of paying everybody at least union scale. Right. And, uh, and I make that clear to everybody, you know, he, he, here's what the pay is. I'll never ask you to do it for less. And then, you know, if we're out for a couple of days, they got to have per diem. They got to do all that type of stuff because I think like for these people, for, for all of these folks, that's what they do seven days a week, right? Not even five days a week, right? Seven days a week for them. So I have to make sure that, that I'm, I'm sort of respecting them, uh, uh, in terms of, um, uh, compensation that I think the way I would, I, you know, the way my lawyer would want to be respected for compensation, the way my trash man wants to be respected for compensation. Cause to me, it's the same thing, right? It's a job. So I got to make sure everybody gets paid. Yep. Note to self, the nine pound hammers are not JC Penny. Don't ever forget that. Nothing on sale. Full freight. Andrew Browning, thanks so much for uh for for joining us today. Love is a beautiful thing is the new record. Where can everyone find you? What's your website address? I'm sure streaming anywhere. Yeah, yeah. The website address is andrewbrowning.net. A-N-D-R-E-W-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G dot net. And yeah, if you have Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, Deezer, uh, uh, Tidal, and then, you know, all the stores none of us have ever heard of in, you know, far-flung parts of Africa and Asia Minor and all of that, we're everywhere. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Loadout Music Podcast. Aaron, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Loadout Music Podcast. Hosted by Atomic Junkshot frontman Aaron Perlett. Find all of our episodes and more at loadoutmusic.com. <laughs>